Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Now, are you ready for the word of the Lord? I am, if you are, and uh, we're going to get into the word of God. Come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord and pray. And let's invite the teacher of the church. Father, we haven't come in the name of Jesus for any other reason other than to give you praise and give you glory, give you honor, and totally and completely recognize that we haven't come to hear from a man or a woman, but we have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord this night, Lord. As you bless us, Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for the way. We thank you for our Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist. We thank you, God, for all the great churches, Ecclesia, that are out there. How about our Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters? Bless them as they gather this night, too. Father, we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say amen. amen. Well, get your Bible and go with me, if you will. I don't even know where we're going. That's what I always say. Get your Bible, go with me. Hey, I have got a message that's just been burning on the inside of me. Go to me, with me to Psalms 37. In Psalms 37, I find a a, a truth, and I want to read it to you, and then I'm going to give you the title of the message. In Psalms 37, it says this, and starting in verse number 23. I say it all the time. I just thought I'd put it in a place so that you can mark it in your Bible. Psalms um, 37 and verse number 23 starts out, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. See the words good man there? Some translations say righteous man. A good man is only good in the eyes of God. There's none good but God. So we're talking about a godly man. There's none good but God. If you want to define good, you can't define good by what man says. You can only define good by what God says. So therefore, when he makes the statement, even Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. So he says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and his delight is in his way. Verse 24, just pop it up on the overhead. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And a lot of things that a lot of times we don't really concentrate on and really figure out in our own lives is how much control God really has in our lives. And we really need to learn to trust in God's control. Let me say it again. We need to learn to trust in God's control. The steps of a righteous man. Righteous, let me define what it means. It means you're born of the Spirit of God and you're working on doing things God's way, and God's will, God's way. That's a righteous man. Let me say it again. You're born of the Spirit of God. In other words, you have a right relationship with God. The Bible says that if you're born of the Spirit of God in Corinthians, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You may not feel like it. You may not act like it positionally because of the blood of the Lord. You are the righteousness of God in, 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 not by yourself or in you, but in Christ Jesus. When you're in Christ Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. Now, there's two types of righteousness you need to understand. Number one is positional. The 
others practice. So positionally, when I get saved, I'm automatically righteous because I'm in Christ Jesus. But my practice, what I do every day, oftentimes it's not very good. It doesn't show a good man. It doesn't show the righteousness that I do. i just working on that part. I'm developing. It says don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And we're finding in Romans, the 12th chapter, we don't need to be conformed to the world, but we need to realize it takes time for our minds to be renewed to what God has to say. Why? So that I can practice what my position really is. But the most important thing is this, is in my lifestyle and in yours, if you are a righteous man or a woman, God has your steps ordered. In other words, he will do everything he can to get you in the place where he can bless you and take care of your life. And he'll manipulate you, and that's a funny word, and I really don't like to use the word manipulate because it gives you the wrong connotation, but he will, he will work you, he will play with you, he'll put things in your path to get you where you need to be in order for you to get to the place where you're blessed. And a lot of times we don't see that. A lot of times we're worried about what God's doing. We're worried about, you know, life. How is it going to work? We're worried about if God's even hearing us, if God's going to come through, if God's going to do anything whatsoever. Does God even know I'm here? And let alone really bless me, get me in the right place. You're like a person who can fall off of a four-story building and land on your feet. At times it will look like what you're doing is worthless. At times times it will look like you have no future. At times it will look like there's a waste of time going on. But my Bible says the steps of a righteous man or a good man, a godly man or woman are ordered of the Lord. God's going to take you someplace. You oftentimes don't even know where you're going or how it's going to work. I can't tell you how many times in Deborah and our life what we have gotten together and all of a sudden we look back to where we came from. And if we didn't do that, 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 been over there, there, and there, we would have never gotten to where we're, oh my goodness, it's like amazing how God corralled us, steps of a righteous man are ordered, and God corralled us where we needed to be at that particular time in order for us to receive the blessings that God has for us. If you don't learn the trusting of God during those periods of time, you'll be frustrated, you'll be worried, you'll be upset, you'll be questioning God all the time. Hey, let me tell you something. You don't want to question God all the time about things like that. What you want to do is you want to rest. You want to be a person that's uh, in control of your emotions. You want to be someone who is confident and peace on the inside because you have a confidence that God is going to come through. You don't know how it's going to work. You don't know what, how, what way it's going to work. It might be the dumbest, craziest thing in the world that you're doing, but it's going to get you to where where you need to be. We so calculate our life. We think, well, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this, this will come about this way, this will come about this way. I like what Dr. Gilfillan said. Dr. Gilfillan one time said, you can think of a thousand ways that something gets done, but God is in the thousand and one ways. He will always do something beyond what you think to get you where you need to be in order to get you blessed because he are a righteous man or woman and he loves you and your steps, wherever you're going, as strange as they may may be from time to time are ordered of the Lord. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Over the years, I, I've seen this all through the Bible. I saw it with Jesus. I saw it with Peter, Paul, James, John. I saw it with everybody in the Bible that you could think of, Old Testament, New Testament. When God uses people and God blesses people. Stop and think about Joseph, his brother. Here's a horrible thing. His brothers sell him off to slavery, beat him up. We're going to kill him. But they decided not to kill him. His brothers, his own blood brothers. Instead, there's a caravan going 
going by to Egypt and they sell him to the caravan to be a slave. He ends up in prison. Oh my goodness. The worst things that could possibly ever imagine. How could any good come from Joseph's life? Did you know he goes from the prison to the palace? He becomes the prime minister of Egypt. No one has more power than him except Pharaoh himself. Is that the nuttiest journey you ever heard in your life? To go from the prison to the palace? Did you know that's exactly what happened to your life? You were in prison. The devil had you in bondage. You were going nowhere and had nothing. God got you saved, set you free, and brings you into his palace. Come on, somebody. And now you're home free. Come on now. That's good news. So we look at the life of Joseph and we say, what a crazy journey. What a crazy journey. But that journey paid off, saved his family's life, saved his brother's lives, even the ones. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing story uh, of the life of Joseph. How about David? How nutty is that story? The greatest king Israel has ever known. My goodness sakes alive. He brought prosperity and blessings to Israel like nobody else. King David was like amazing in what he does and does for the people. But the journey getting to where he needed to be is like the most bizarre journey in the world. And only God could conceive of such a thing. I'm teaching my Bible college class tomorrow night and I was just thinking, about because we're going to get into the heart of David. That's what this is all about. And we're just thinking about it all day long on how God can use someone like David. I would have thought when David was on the hills of Judea as a young man singing praises to God and then, you know, God anoints him by uh, uh, wonderful Samuel to be the king over Israel. He's just a little boy, a shepherd boy that doesn't know how to be a king. He he gets in front of Goliath. Remember that story? He throws his sling, throws the rock, hits Goliath in the head. I love the History Channel. They have no concept of spiritual things. When you see them explaining spiritual things, just turn it to how something is made on a different channel or something else because the History Channel is like nuts when it comes to spiritual things. They have no concept. They're totally carnal. Anyway, they throws the rock man, it kills the giant, he cuts the head off, he is a rock star in Israel. I would have think he was ready for to be the king right there. After all, he's got all the popularity, he's the rock star, he is everything, man. All the, No, no, now he's got to go through years and years and years on this journey. It's a tormenting journey in order for him to be the good king that God wanted him to be. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And that doesn't mean they're easy. Sometimes they are difficult. You say, Pastor, why did you say e? Because I got your attention. And why did you say difficult? Because you all opened your eyes and lifted your head up as soon as I did that. Because when I act that way, you've got to give me your attention just to see whether or not I'm going to pass out any minute. And so guess what? It, it may not be the easiest thing in the world, this journey that God's got you on, but I've got good news for you. Here's the good news. It's the best journey in the world because God says your steps are ordered of the Lord. I was reading about King Saul. Before I tell you and take you to the chapter in King Saul, maybe you want, want to go there in 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter. Here we find the children of Israel, they're frustrated with God. What a bunch of dummies. And listen to this. And they want a king to rule them. They don't want God to rule them any longer. Let me tell you something. God's not in a democracy. God's not in a, 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 a type of an organization where, where uh, governments rules a sociology of some form. God is in a theocracy where God rules through his high priests. And it's always been that way for Israel. But Israel got frustrated with God. And they said, he, they said to 
to Samuel, Samuel, we don't want any longer to have the priests over us. You're getting old, and what we want is we want our own king like all the other nations. And it just broke the heart of God. I mean, some of the saddest scripture in the, in the find in the Bible is that just God's heart was just aching. God said, they didn't reject you, Samuel. They rejected me. And God was just so, so hurt over the fact that they didn't want God any longer. They wanted a king. So God says, tell them this is what your king is going to be like. He'll be what you think he's going to be like in looks, but he'll take from you. He'll steal your children, steal your crops. He'll steal everything from you. And they still said, we don't care. We still want a king. Boy, you talk about a belligerent group of people coming against God. I hope you're not that way, and I hope I'm not that way, where God wants something, and I don't care what God wants. My wants got to be bigger than God's wants. I hope we're, none of us are that way. Then God finally says to Samuel, the prophet in the land. He says, Samuel, stand back. I'll give them the king that they want. Well, God has his eye on a young man named Saul. Saul has no concept of the journey he's about to be on. Saul is actually a really good guy. He really ends up a bad, very bad king over Israel and crazy and loses his mind uh, consulting with witches and demons and he's a very ends up very bad but he starts out very good starts out very strong starts out very if you will courteous and kind and he just didn't have the tools on the inside to finish that race and so God saw Saul before Saul ever saw himself let me tell you something, my friends. God saw you before you ever saw yourself. And there's a future God has for you that you haven't yet even seen yet. Because that's the way God was. He was that way with David. God said this about King David. I have chosen for me a man after my own heart. David was just a little boy on the hills of Judea. Had no idea that the steps of a righteous man were ordered of the Lord. And God had already told and God had already knew who it was that he was going to make king. And his name was David, but David didn't know anything about it. Let me tell you something, as you're sitting there today, tonight, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. There's something God wants to do. You don't even know. You don't have a concept, but I'm here to tell you, when you start to trust in the order of the Lord and stay righteous before God, maybe I say this to you, he will bring it to pass. Listen closely. I want to just share with you, here's this man by the name of Saul, he's being introduced, who becomes the first king of Israel. He's just a young man. And the Bible describes who he is in the ninth chapter of 1 Samuel. The reason I'm saying this, listen, I want you to hear me now. The reason I'm saying this, the reason I'm going there is so that you will see the bizarre story of the life of Saul and how Saul got him, God got Saul, how Saul, God got Saul before the prophet Samuel. Because without the prophet Samuel, Saul would never have been king over Israel. He had no idea he was going to be king. He had no idea that greatness was ahead of him. He had no idea that God had his eyes fixed on him. He had no idea about the anointing that was going to be on him. Just like many of you that's in this place this very night. But I'm here to tell you something. What God sees, oftentimes we don't see. And the journey that God will take you on is a wild journey that ends up, if you stay in there with God, with the total and complete blessings more than you could ever imagine. Come on, somebody. So let's take a look and let me read you. I'm going to read a lot of verses. Is that okay? I'm going to read a lot of verses. And I want you to follow me the very best you can. They'll be on the overhead. But uh, I, I want to start, if I may, in, in uh, 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter, verse number 1. There was a, a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, and the son of 
B. Chalkworth, son of Abaphath and a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. This is such an interesting subject. You see those last words, mighty man of power? Do you know what that means? Very, very wealthy. Have you ever thought, of course you haven't, but I'll tell you something. Just a side note, just food for thought. Have you ever thought about how many people God uses that come from families that are very, very wealthy? You stop and think about it. Remember the family of the great prophet Elijah when he had his oxen? He was like the Bill Gates of the time when God called him. Why this rich man? Remember David? He was in the house of Jesse, father grazing his sheep outside the hills of Jerusalem in the hills of Judea. Eyesight to Jerusalem. Oh my goodness. Wealthy, Wealthy, one after another after another. You ever wondered why? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's a different message. I'm saving that for the pastors in May. Listen to this in verse number two. Because let me tell you, I'll just give you a little hint. There's a character on the inside of people who can weather the storms and make something happen. You will never see God said, I selected him from that poverty, broken down, no good, gutter sucking slob on welfare, and he is going to be the king. It uh, doesn't work that way. It's the one that can endure, that can fight. It's the one who's uh, confident, the one who's got the goods, the one who's not afraid to have the pressure on them that make things work. And did you know that businessmen who make things work have something on the inside of them, and God's looking for that something that gets things done that, ooh, are you following me? I, 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 that's just a little hint. I don't even want to go there. That's only verse number one. I got 19 more to read to you now. I'm going to be in big trouble if we don't stop. We're talking about the steps of a righteous man being order of the Lord and the bizarre journey of Saul. Saul doesn't even know at this point. He's just being described. Verse number two, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not more handsome person and he was among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. Man, so this guy was obvious. God says it twice and two times. How many of you believe when God says something twice, he must have been really hot? Are you hearing me, girls? He was hot. This guy had it all together. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, God knew it. And he was, he was something else in verse number two. Verse number three. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. Oh, wait a minute. When you read this story, who gives a flip about the donkeys of Kish? Have you ever read that before? And you say, oh, what is that all about? I, who, I, we go from King Saul being mighty. We go from Kish, his father, being rich. We go from a mighty, powerful man. We give his bloodline to show that he's all there. And then all of a sudden, we the donkeys are gone. <laughs> Somebody let the donkeys out. And you like scratch your head because here's this crazy journey. A journey that you and I would never have thought of that takes Saul to where he needs to be in order to hear the story of how he becomes king. Are you following me? And the donkeys do it. <laughs> and Kish said, listen to this. And Kish said to his son Saul, please take one of the servants with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. Now, the neat thing about Saul He's a very rich boy in a rich family with servants. The Bible already said his father's very rich. But notice how he respected his father. He didn't say, Dad, I've got something else in mind. I'm going down to Burger King, meeting the buds down there. I can't quite go, you know, I can't do this. I got to get some new rims that are waiting for me in my car. You know, I, I can't do this. Here he's what he tells his dad. He, you know, get a couple of servants to go look for donkeys. How many people like to go look for donkeys? You know what donkeys are? 
It's like they're out there grazing somewhere. You know, all you have to do is go find. So he, he didn't tell his dad, go get a servant, look for the donkeys. Here's Saul, an interesting, respectful young man that does what his father wants him to do. It says, take one of the servants with your eyes and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shulashah, but did not find them. And then he passed through the land of Shamalim, and, and, and they were not there. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they were not to be found. In other words, he's out there, by the way, by his time, his couple of days have gone by looking for these donkeys. And he finally, verse number five, and he says, and when he had come to the land of uh, Zufra, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come, let us return, lest my father ceases caring about the donkeys and becomes worried about us. So here's Saul caring about the condition of his father. Pretty respectful, pretty nice young man. And he comes along in verse number six and he says to him, this is the servant saying to Saul, and he says, look, now, uh, there in this city is a man of God, and he's an honorable man, and all that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go up there, and perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. And Saul said to his servant, uh, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? And I'm not going to go there because they're not going to approach the man of God without a gift. That's a different story. So he goes on and he explains all of this. They finally go up to the city, and as they walk into the city to meet with the prophet, Samuel, here's what happens. They meet up with some women. Let's take a look at this in verse number 13. And soon as you come, the women tell him into the city, you will surely find him before as he goes into the high places to eat, for the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Uh, afterwards, those uh, who were invited will eat. The women are telling and talking about the man of God, the prophet. Now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. And they went up in the city, and as they were coming into the city, there was Samuel coming out towards them on the way to the high place. High places where they offered the sacrifice. Isn't it funny how God took him through all those different lands, literally walking for days and days, looking for donkeys in order to run into a guy that's a prophet of God named Samuel who knows something that Saul, the king, doesn't even know. Isn't it funny how you can be on a journey even tonight and not know where you're going, what you're doing, and your journey seems like it's meaningless, but God's hand is upon you and your direction is anointed by him and he's taking you someplace you don't even know you're going to. It seems like it's worthless, but I tell you at the end, it'll cry out with a shout about the goodness and glory of God. And all of a sudden he walks into the city, talks to these women, they say, go on up that way, you might run into him. And they turn the corner and here is Samuel. But here's what Samuel says. Now the Lord told Samuel, verse 15, in his ear the day before Saul came, before Saul came, before Saul came, before Saul knew, before anything, before Samuel knew, God had him on a road. Oftentimes you'd go to men of God. Now, if he had talked to him two days earlier, Samuel would never have been able to tell him what he needed to do. It's not about what the man of God has to say. It's about what God has to say. And God's taking you someplace and you gotta know that you are going somewhere that may seem meaningless to you. You may in your own personal life be chasing donkeys right now, but I'm here to tell you, God's got something great for you. See, and then all of a sudden it goes on and let's just take a look at where it goes on. It says, verse number 16, tomorrow, remember God speaking to Samuel, the prophet. Tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel and he will save my people from the hand of the Philistines. And he says, and I have looked upon my people because their cries have come to me. Doesn't God care even though the people are screwed up? Now stop thinking about it. God cares even though the people are screwed up. 
Sometimes we wonder how God does this. That's what makes him God. If, he, if I was God, I'd have sent fire from heaven upon him. But I'm not God. He's God. He sends mercy and love. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Verse 17, then Samuel saw Saul, and the Lord said to him, there is the man of whom I speak to you. This one shall reign over my people. I'm going to stop right there. It's an amazing story about how the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. It looks like you're doing nothing. It looks like you're chasing donkeys in your life. But I don't care if you're the righteousness of God, you got to know God will lead you someplace. It looks like it's worthless. The nothing meaningless will come out of it, but God will lead you to a place where there's blessings and prosperity. Because God loves you and God cares about you. All you have to do is stop doubting the very power of God that's put you in a journey that seems like it's weird. Could it be any more weird than that of Joseph? Could it be any more weird than that of David? Could it be any more weird than that of Saul? Could it be any more weird than to be called out behind six yoke of oxen? My goodness, like Elijah, how weird is that? Have you ever noticed how God will put you on a weird road but you end up in a great place if you have confidence in his control. Oh, hear me now. It's so important for all of us. It took me a lifetime to figure that out, and you get to learn it at your young age. My goodness sakes. Three things I want to go through quickly with you, and I mean quickly. I'm going to do it in five minutes. It brings your trust, brings, builds your trust level with God. Building your trust level. Number one, you got to commit to the Lord. I'm just going to pop these on the overhead. you got to commit. There's, listen, there's no way you're going to get to be a righteous man and do what God has to say. If you're on a boring road following after donkeys, if you're in a prison like Joseph, if you're being run over by your enemy and chased by your enemy like David, if you're being called away from something great to do something that seemingly is small, I'm here to tell you something right now. Without a commitment, you will not do it. In Proverbs, the 16th chapter, verse 3, it says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts and your thoughts and your thoughts will be what? Established. Is that a bizarre verse? Commit your ways to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Some of you got thoughts about stuff. You're chasing donkeys and you don't know how it's going to come to pass. But my Bible says, if you'll make a commitment to the Lord, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord will take you where you need to go. Why do you think the story is in the Bible? Why do you think he's telling us about Saul? Verse after verse after verse, day after day in his life. Why is it there? It's there to teach us something about ourselves. But oftentimes these crazy little stories of adventure that we're on, can you can trust the Lord will lead us someplace great. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart, a man's heart plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. Is that a great verse? Man's heart, I got my old plans all lined out. Yes, but are you trusting God? So your plans come to pass or his? Can I just ask anybody in this room, whose plans are best for your life? You know, stop thinking about it. Of course, it's got to be God. God knows the right man and girls to marry. God knows the right woman, guys, to marry. God knows the right business for you to be in. God knows the right place at the right time, taking you to the right place in order to get the right thing done. But you're going to have to be committed to the Lord. Totally and completely. And understand, you may be chasing donkeys today, but tomorrow there's something special. Come on, somebody. Number two, we're talking about building your trust level with God. Number two, you're going to have to follow his lead. And man, that's tough. Following his lead, his lead is not oftentimes 
just a voice or pat on the back or a shoulder or here's the most people's leads. What feels good, what seems right, following the lead of God. He'll, you'll just know that you know that you know. You know the children of Israel had to follow the lead of God. In Numbers, listen to this, I'll just pop it up on the overhead. In the ninth chapter, verse 18, at the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey. And at the command of the Lord, they would camp. In other words, when God told them to walk, they walked. When God told them to make camp, they made camp. They had to be committed, they had to follow the lead. But here's the lead, want to know the lead? Weird one, watch this. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained in camp. The Bible goes, as a cloud moved, they knew to get up and move. You're going to have to be so sensitive to God that you learn how to follow his lead. If you don't, man, you're going to find yourself in a place, but you've got to trust that he'll take you. You could fall off a four-story building and land on your feet because God's with you. Here's, here, let, me t let me give you a verse for that. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. All things are possible to him that believes. Nothing's impossible. To him that believes. I can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens me. Those are verses that all support the fact that you fall off a four-story building and land on your feet. You don't have to be worried about that, but you're going to have to learn and look for the lead of the Lord. God wants to lead you and follow you. Third one is real quick. We're talking about building trust levels. Number one, stop grumbling. You're chasing donkeys and you're grumbling. As long as you keep grumbling, you will keep chasing. That's what I found out. Until you put your confidence in God, then he says, oh, they learned the lesson. Yes. Philippians 2, 12 says it like this. Verse 12 says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. That's a powerful verse. In other words, God's in what? Control. And the control he has for you is for his good pleasure. Let me tell you something. His good pleasure is better than your pleasure. But the next verse, right after he makes that statement, do all things without complaining and disputing. Stop grumbling. You may find yourself in a place of chasing donkeys or donkeys even chasing you. <laughs> you know it, so as I. Forget the donkeys, man. They're after me. I'm not after them. But God's got it all worked out together. It's a lesson Debbie and I have had to learn all of our life. As grandma and grandpas, we're taught, our children, we're teaching you the steps of a righteous man are order the Lord. Sit back, take a deep breath, relax. Yeah, it's tough times and time's going by, but God's in control. And he'll take nothing and make something out of it. By the way, Saul was invited to eat with Samuel. Yes. And then Samuel, the prophet, says to Saul, he's completely mixed up. He looks at him and says, you know those donkeys that you have been chasing for the last few days? They've already been found, so relax. Because God wants to use you. And Saul goes, me? I'm nobody. Get the fact that we are all nobodies. He is the only one that's somebody. And he takes nobodies and makes somebodies out of them. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave because nothing could be worse. Some of you have been chasing donkeys and donkeys been chasing you. And some of you, you don't know if you are a donkey. But let's make sure you're right with God before you leave this place because God knows who you're at, who you are. I want to make sure before you leave tonight that if anything should happen to you, that you go to heaven. Is that okay? That's simple.
You were great listening to the word of the Lord. But I want to make sure that you go to heaven. Give me just a few more minutes and I'll let you go. Just a few more minutes. If you were to walk out of this building, I want you to answer this question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Some people say, I don't believe in hell. Well, it's in the Bible. It's like saying, I don't believe in Mack trucks. Go stand in the freeway. One's going to run you over. Just because you don't believe in it doesn't mean they're not real. So let's go with the Bible, not what men say. Now, if you die, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Let's talk about it. And what makes you think? Your answer says a lot about you. What makes you think you're going to make it? Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I hope if I died, I hope I'm going to go. Guess what? Nowhere does it say you get to hope your way into heaven. Whoever has the greatest hope gets there. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't you think it's in the Bible? If I love God enough, I could get to heaven. It's not in the Bible. No, not going to. It's not going to get you to heaven. You say, well, Pastor Jim, hold on a minute, man. You know, my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian and that makes you... No, not even if they had a christened or baptized as a baby. Not if they put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Nowhere in the Bible is that going to get you to heaven. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, I, I, I joined my last church. I was a Christian church. I was there for years. Sang in the choir. I was there for years. I, I've just, you know, helped the pastor out, counted the offerings. I, I was a leader in the church, taught Sabbath school or Sunday school in my church. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible to say because you're a leader in the church, joined the church, sang in the choir, helped the pastor out, any of that stuff. Nowhere in the Bible to say you get to go to heaven. Nowhere, 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 nowhere. You're not, somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough, stop playing games with you and tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Did you know there's only one way to get to heaven? Listen, one way. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, listen to these words, no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way, my way. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committees where you're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you you're not going to make it. No, there's only one way and that's Jesus' way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in John 3rd chapter. John 3rd chapter says it like this. You must be born again. Jesus says that you must be born again. Most people in American churches today do not understand what born again means. They just don't. And so I'll tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. I'll sum it all up for you. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. It's all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Is that okay? Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? That was a crude, rude statement. But what did he really just say? He really said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it to heaven. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow, that's a freaky thing to think about. But it's true. You're not going to make it. Lukewarm, let me define what that means. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Watch this. Lukewarm. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Now watch this. Watch this. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something. 
Man, that's lukewarm. And a lot of times people come along and call themselves Christians, call themselves this, call themselves that, when in fact their heart is really far from God the way it needs to be in order for them to get right with God. You gotta give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. The reason I say give, because he's not a thief or a robber, robber to rob it from you. It's your heart, your life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of. not a manipulator to make you do this. It's your call, your choice. Now stop, think about it. Stop, stop, stop for a moment. Look, watch this. Think about this. He could have made robots that look just like you, a billion or a trillion of them, don't tell me he couldn't have, that would all praise his name, would all worship him, would all quote the scripture, would all come back and sing songs to him. He could have made a billion trillion robots look just like you, but he doesn't. You know what he does? He gives you a free will choice. And he says, now I'm putting you on the planet. There's a lot of distractions on that planet, a lot of places you can go and live out your life, but will you live it for me? And that's your call and that's your choice. And for every one of us that are in here, that's what's gonna get you to heaven and that's what's gonna keep you out of heaven. Your call, your choice. What do you do with your life? Well, you just gotta give it to him. All of your heart, and give it all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? How do I do such a thing? Well, let's don't do it my way. Let's do it Jesus's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, I'm a man, I will see your response. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'll pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. One, two, three. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is this simple thing. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I already know you know who he is in your head. I already know you celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. I already know you know who Jesus is. But did you know that won't get you to heaven? Everybody knows who Jesus is. That doesn't make you a Christian. The devil knows who Jesus is. Trust me, he's not a Christian going to heaven. And you're not going to make it either with head knowledge. You've got to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life because that's what he's after. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. Bang, when I do, you get your hand up. Who should raise their hand? Come on. You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Get ready. If you're one of those people that are not sure whether you really have or not, maybe you prayed with Billy Graham, maybe you prayed at a Harvest Crusade, that's great. But did you follow up those prayers? with all of your heart and life, or were they just a little magical abracadabra formula you call a prayer? Hopefully you think that formula is gonna get you out of heaven. Don't you, uh, keep you out of hell and get you into heaven. Don't you think God's, he, don't treat him like he's an idiot. He knows and watches your life that follows your heart to whether or not your prayer is real. Now tonight is your night of salvation. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands. You say, wait a minute, pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I can't raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People I came with, they'll see me, man. Uh, people behind me will see me, I'll feel weird. Uh-huh, you might feel weird, you might be embarrassed, get over it. You know why? Because it's better to feel weird and be embarrassed in a safe place like this, safe, safe place like this, than in hell forever and ever because you are more afraid of what people think instead of what God sees, come on. No one, no one's that dumb, but the devil thinks you are and he's trying to talk you out of it right now. I'm gonna count three, pop my hand up, pop my hands together, you get your hand up, put it right back down all across this auditorium, even back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, even on the internet worldwide right now in all the different countries, you can get your hand up right now and there's a little button to push right there, I think it's a blue button that you can push and say you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior and, and, and I tell you what, we'll pray with you right there on the internet all across this auditorium, are you ready? Here it is, I'm counting to three. One, two, Three, 
Hallelujah. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Back over here. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve. God bless you. Thirteen, fourteen. Thank you. Back on this side. Anybody else? Fourteen. I think I already counted you. There's fourteen. Go ahead. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? There's fourteen. Where are you? Fifteen. There's another one somewhere. Okay. Got you. Fifteen right here. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's fifteen wise people. Another one where? Further out, further out, further out, further out. Somebody's pointing over here somewhere. Wave at me that hand wherever you're at because I hear fifteen, but they're pointing their sixteen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for fifteen wise people. Isn't God good? Okay, all 15 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. No one leave during this period of time. If you're serious about God, you raise your hand. Now, wait a minute. If you didn't raise your hand and you're sitting there and you're saying, mm, I should have, and you know who you are. Come on, you know it, and so does God. Get all your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. You can join the people right in the aisle. Just meet me right here in front. That's all as simple as that. I want you to get your stuff. If you raised your hand or if you didn't, but you know you should have, no one leaves during this period of time. Let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Cause you're all I want. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand if they come. And you're all I ever needed. And you're all I want. Come on, you come too. Come on. Come on! I know you are near. Wow, there's more than 15. And you're come on, come on, come on. all I want. And you're all I ever got good. Got good. needed. Well, thank God you guys have come. We're real excited about you coming and listen I want you to look to your left this is Dr. Becker Pastor Becker is a really good guy no weird stuff goes on I'm weird he's cool is that okay and you've already gotten past me he's a good guy so here's what I want you to do hold on hold on you just let him come here's what I want you to do I want you to listen closely he's going to do three things one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to do that. Jesus doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes in because you invite him. He is a gentleman and won't come into your heart, which belongs to you, unless you invite him in. That's a prayer. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, free literature about what to do next, okay? Now that you're a Christian, because you're going to be a Christian in a few minutes. And guess what? He's going to give you some free literature about what to do next. Just read it and do it, okay? Third thing, he's going to introduce you to a spiritual, personal trainer. That's a friend. We give away friends here. They'll meet you before church service. Why? Because we want to encourage you to go forward. Why? Because you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do this. We don't want you to go back into the world and fall through the cracks with your old buddies again. We want you to go on with Jesus. Let us help you to do it. So if you're serious, get a hold of a spiritual personal trainer. Meet him sometime in the future before church service and let's Let's go with God and we'll help you get strong with the Lord. Make a left turn. Follow Dr. Becker right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Ain't God good? Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise.